day, mate. Welcome to Zoomerang. As we zoom around Australia, we'll discover some amazing animals and sights. More importantly, like a boomerang, we are returning kids to what the Bible says about the value of life. We'll discover how precious each and every one of us is to God, from the tiniest to the oldest. Each person is made in the image of God, wonderfully designed to know Him and to live for Him. Out of His great love, God offers us salvation through His Son, Jesus. Kids will learn that life is valuable. Grab your sunnies, that's your sunglasses and your mates. Those are your friends and get ready for a fair dinkum time at Zoomerang. Good morning. As everybody's making their way in, we're going to go ahead and get started with one that I'm sure all of you will know. You can go ahead and stand with us. We're going to start with Owl Fly Away.
continue with Cornerstone.
Good morning, everyone. So this week we are going to focus on Leslie and her son Avery and the Smiths um, out in Colorado Springs, Colorado. They are serving with Engineering Ministries International. Um, Leslie continues her work with engineering with EMI and has had a very busy year with the International Directors Conference held back in Colorado back in March. The conference hosted the directors of all the international offices and allowed spiritual growth and refreshing and collaboration. Um, Leslie was even asked to lead a learning session on the fellowship program, which she has developed and now oversees. Um, this fellowship program is to give spiritual and professional direction to the interns working in the field offices and can positively impact the lives of those early um, in their career design professionals. Um, Leslie has also helped move the EMI Colorado team to its new home. EMI now owns their own office space. This is the first time EMI has done that. So, so while continuing to renovate her and Avery's home, she is helping EMI as well with her newfound skills. If you remember last time, she was learning how to use a lot of power tools. So um, Avery has turned four. That uh, just doesn't seem possible. But this also means that they've been in Colorado now for three and a half years. And she says how time has flown. Most recently, his daycare has had to close again due to a COVID outbreak. Um, but this time, Avery has tested positive. So Leslie last week was at home caring for him and trying to work as well. So I don't know about you guys, but trying to entertain a four-year-old and work from home probably had many challenges. Um, so far, uh, Leslie has had no symptoms, so that is a good thing. Um, just continue to pray for Leslie as she seeks out new supporting partners in the ministry, um, as she supports the EMI International Offices and is a mom to Avery. She sends her gratitude to Faith Baptist for their 10 years of support. She writes, so grateful for the years of support and all the fruit that has come from this partnership besides the financial support. I'm always blown away by the people in Covington and their desire to support missions financially, prayerfully, and practically. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Faith Baptist. Um, got a couple of announcements here. Uh, does anybody know what's starting on June the 27th? Vacation Bible School. It's that time of year again already. So June the 27th through July the 1st. There's several ways that if anybody would like to help, there's a sign-up sheet out here. Also, um, tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 11 a.m. until 4 p.m., and then Thursday and Friday of this week from 11 a.m. until 8 p.m. And then Saturday from 11 a.m. until whenever, until you get done decorating for VBS. If anybody would like to help, be here at the church. Um, also, there's a list of food items that is needed in the Welcome Center. Um, if anybody would like to sign up to bring an item, uh, please have it to the church by Friday um, noon on the 24th. Um, I know prior to church, there's a the PowerPoint is going up here with lots of prayer requests and whatnot. Um, be sure to look at this. Look at your bulletins. There are people out here that have cancer, people that are homebound, people that are in the hospital, people that are having upcoming surgeries. There are I know in a group this size, there are people that just have unspoken requests. So try to remember somebody, two or three people every day and pray for them. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this glorious day that you have given us to be here in your house, Father, to come and worship you, to praise you, Father, and to sing music. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the voices to do that. And Father, as we go through this service, we ask, Lord, that you open our hearts and our minds, Lord, to hear what you have to speak through Brother Andy, Father. And let us use these things everywhere that we go to bring honor and glory to you. Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity today to tithe and to give back a portion to you, Father, that you have so greatly blessed us with. And may be used to further your kingdom with our missionaries, as Kathleen spoke about and other missionaries around the world and around our country and here locally. 
And Father, may everything that we do and say always bring glory to you. And Father, as we go through this week, Father, we ask that you give us the opportunity to step out of our comfort zone, Lord. Give us somebody that we can witness to and tell them what you've done for us. And Father, as we go through this day, Father, let us remember all the fathers that have been here and the fathers that are here today and fathers that have brand new babies, Father. We ask, Lord, that you continue to bless them and give them the wisdom to bring up their children. And just thank you for all your many gifts, Father, that you give to us. And we ask all of these things in the blood of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Brother Tim. You know, I like to think about parallels between our Heavenly Father and our earthly fathers. And, um, you know, I, I, think, I, I think it's just a cool um, thing that God has done in, uh, in making some of those parallels, unconditional love. Not that our earthly fathers are perfect, but we can model our lives, seek to model, strength to meet trials, and uh, mingling toil with rest. How many of you know what, a, what it means to have a long road to hoe? Ever hear that? Well, I remember very distinctly being on the end of a long row of corn and trying to get to the other end, you know, hoeing that stuff. And there was a jug of water on the other end. But I also remember some great restful times on Dunlap Creek, you know, throwing the lizards and the, and the uh, earth, earthworms in there and catching those bass. So Dad gave us uh, a little bit of both. Let's all stand as we sing day by day. seated. Uh, thank you, Brother Mike. Good morning. If uh, you didn't get the memo today, your dad is disappointed because it is Father's Day. So I would like for everyone who is a father to please stand. And we have a, a gift for you. Just go ahead and stand up. If, if you're a, a father here today, and uh, for those of us, thank you very much to 
all of you for being fathers. And once you've uh, received that gift that we have for you, if you could uh, take a seat and we'll get that out. I remember probably the most important lesson of my life I learned from my father. Um, My family moved numerous, numerous times. And I think I was in, I don't know, 15 or 20 schools by the time I was in eighth grade. And uh, part of that moving is actually moving. Oh, thank you. There's a little flashlight in here and some, they were talking about putting chocolates in here. I'm like, no, get meat sticks. We don't want no chocolates. (laughs) All right. So part of that is actually doing the moving bit. And I remember being fourth or fifth grade, we had the, you know, big long step van U-Haul thing, just chock full of uh, all of our furniture and stuff. We're moving into the, the house in Cedar. And it probably took two full days of just, you know, work, sweat, summer, hard lifting. And I remember at the end of that time, my dad slipped like a $20 bill into my back pocket and said uh, nothing about it. Just, you know, like that tiny little lesson about hard work will pay off. And then uh, going forward, I wasn't the most um, athletic or intellectual or gifted uh, musically child, but I had interest in these things. And so I was encouraged uh, that having the natural talent to do something is not what makes a person necessarily good at it or even great at it, but it is their perseverance and commitment to work at it. And so as much as I'm sure it bothered my parents to hear me playing the trumpet in the basement or the back room or the backyard, uh, they didn't dissuade me and even allowed me the space to do that. And I even played trumpet for the Navy for a little while. I was never musical, but I was I could, I could play really well. I was a technician. I wasn't the fastest, most natural, gifted athlete, but they you know, encouraged me and gave me the room and space to, to practice, and they moved us way out in the country where our closest neighbor friends were two miles away and promised to beat me if I didn't get home before dark, so I was encouraged to run far and fast. There are lots of ways to motivate kids. Right, so when I went into track, I I I, I could run the 800, uh, you know, really really fast, like faster than all the other kids in our area, and I didn't realize it. I was just trying to get home so I wouldn't get a beating, you know. That was was like I could go faster, coach. He's like, no, 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 save that for you know the end, um, you know. And and they encouraged me to actually do the work to to learn, to read, to uh, you know the the. Your bedtime is 10 o'clock, but I never got in trouble for reading past bedtime. If the TV were on or something like that, that would be a problem. But these these lessons of growing up were what I remember, and and probably the most important thing that I remember is that giving your best effort, when you get to a job, it's not work harder than the people who are there. It's do the best job you can do. When you get to school, it isn't get a better grade than the person who's next to you is do the best work you can do. Give the most effort you can. And if you end up successful, then you'll know it was on account of you putting your heart and effort into that. If you end up not being the best, you still know that you gave it your all. And so that that was the lesson that, that I remember from growing up. Now, I got a little quiz for you. If... You stood up and you were a father and your child is less than a year old. Would you raise your hand? We have no parents. How about less than 18 months old? Nobody with an 18-month-old is here. How about two years? Three. Can I get a three-year-old? Here, we got a three-year-old. Well, you've got uh, uh, one on the on the way, too, so that that. That, that counts. How about, so we, we have the, the father of the youngest dad who's here with us today. How old is Addison? 
21 months. So actually, she's younger than um, Reagan. Reagan's two? Yep, by a couple months. And Lila Gray is two, but Dad's not here today. He's working, so. So a couple of young kids. How about raise your hand if you have a child who's over 50 years old? 55? 60? Oh, Corky's hand is up. Raise your hand if your child is over 100. Oh, uh, we have to pray. This is not going well. <laughs> I'm going to get beat up by Janice after service today. She's shaking her head. Yes, you are. All right, let's pray. Father, we have uh, fathers across the spectrum here, from, from young uh, to old, and, and we seek uh, today to hear Paul's words um, to the Thessalonians about um, about his ministry and the way that parents uh, were the model that he used to, to teach them. And we ask that we would hear your heart today, that we would understand uh, our role today and, and what, what we should encourage fathers to be if we aren't a father ourselves. And I ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be taking a look at 2 Thessalonians um, chapter 6. I think I might have made a mistake. Yeah, I definitely, definitely erred when I put that title up there. First Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in the second half of verse 6. Uh, just a quick note, the chapters and verse numbers in your Bible, they were not originally put there by Paul and Peter. They were put there thousands of, well, uh, 1,300 years later and 1,500 years later. The actual verse numbers were put in by a, a man named of Robert Estian. Uh, when he was ordained to the ministry, he took the Latin name Stephanus. And the story goes, when Stephanus was riding his horse from Germany to the university at Paris, he was marking up his Greek Bible with the verse numbers, and every time the horse would trot, his pen would hit the paper, and that's when a new verse would start. And when we run into a situation like today where the thought kind of is interrupted in the middle of a verse, that that's where the horse stumbled. So the, the verse got put in the, the wrong spot. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the second half of verse 6 through verse 12 is, is what we're going to be looking at. And this passage is not actually teaching on motherhood and fatherhood. It's teaching on Paul's apostolic ministry and how he approached the ministry. But the example that he used is 100% dependent on us having a right understanding of what a father and a mother is supposed to be doing. If you don't rightly understand the role of those parents in the family, then you can't understand properly what Paul is saying. So we're going to take a look at the underlying truth that Paul is depending on in these verses as he is expressing uh, how his ministry was. And he begins this part of the defense of his ministry with the statement that though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Now, Paul, Peter, John, Andrew, these guys, James, the, the half-brother of Jesus, had a very unique responsibility in the early church that has not continued since then. Their responsibility was to deliver the word of God. They walked with Jesus. They were immediately in the presence of Jesus, appointed and anointed to carry out the gospel. Their successors after them, the elders of the churches, did not have that same authority. So Paul is making the statement here that I know that I have a particular privilege. That, that your response to my particular privilege, Paul would say, as an apostle, 
would be that I could place demands or burdens on you for honor, for financial assistance. And it's like that inside of the home. God has appointed you as a father in a home with particular responsibilities that come with privilege. The law itself was written for us to know that we should, in fact, give to our parents this demand, this, this honor. The, the word there in Hebrew, uh, well, in Greek is glorium. It's to proclaim the rightness of, to uh, act according to the way that they would want you to act, to be obedient to, to not go to work or school and, 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 and defame your parents and talk bad about your folks, but rather to lift them up in the presence of others. Honor, glorium, your father and your mother. And, and, it, and he says that your days may be long in the land that is the Lord your gave. And Paul, picking up on this in instructions to families, made the point that you should honor your father and mother, just like the law says. And then as a as a little aside to that, he said, and oh, by the way, don't forget, this is the first commandment with a promise. And the promise is that it may go well with you and that you may live long or have a full life in the land. Paul, as an apostle, said, I have this privilege. I could make demands on you and us as fathers uh, in, a, in a family could say the same thing about our kids. Or, or even to our wives as their husbands. But immediately after writing these words about uh, how children are supposed to honor their father and mother, Paul didn't stop, didn't even take a breath. He said, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. In the same way, the Apostle Paul introducing his ministry here, he says, though, I could, though we could make demands on you as an apostle, he did not want to be a burden to them, and as fathers, it should be the same thing. Our heart uh, should be oriented in that way, not as a um, dictator of a home, but the, the head disciple maker in the home. And the reason this is important is, is practical, just like the law said that it may go well with you and that you would live long in the land. The same is true about honoring your father and mother for fathers not to provoke our children to anger lest they become discouraged. What happens with discouragement is that turns to bitterness. And bitterness toward parents turns toward bitterness toward the church and kids end up walking away from their faith. Proverbs 14, 26 makes the point that it is in the fear of the Lord that one has strong confidence and his children will have a refuge not fear of dad in particular, but showing the example of God in your fatherhood role. Paul, as an apostle, did the same thing. He said, we could have made demands on you. So the first point is that, that fatherness, this, this point that Paul is making is that although he could be demanding the authority that his given has privilege, but he's going to use that privilege in a godly, wise way to disciple the people that he's responsible for. And that truth needs to hit us as parents too. I don't know if it's true of you also, but it is true of me that when I know that I have a particular place or position that is disrespected, by somebody, it doesn't just sound wrong, it feels wrong to me. And it can cause your feeling to return in a way that makes you want to demand the respect of a person, demand the respect of your child who's talking back to you, demand that they obey you because they were out late at night because I said so or I'm your father. Paul says, uh, be careful. when you." There are times, there are absolute times when you must set down the rules and hold the rules and enforce the rule, especially when your child is doing something that is uh, absolutely ridiculous, especially boys. 
I say this as a child who grew up, you know, a boy. Like, let's go jump our bikes over the electric fence. This will be fun. <laughs> I did that. I'm not I'm making me say that up. That we, this was a game, right? Or let's see how long we can hold on to it with your friends, right? Like, I did mention I wasn't the smartest kid, right? Like, so, so using not in a demanding way, but in a way that is uh, wise and godly, that, that seeks to uh, train up a child in the way they should go, right? That seeks to show them. And don't blame us as boys, by the way. Your brain, uh, before you're about 25 years old, isn't done like putting things together up in the front here. Like, that's a scientific fact. When your kid gets on the dirt bike and does 100 miles an hour over the gravel pit, thinking they're going to reach the water, it's not that they're dumb. Their brain just literally isn't working the way it's supposed to. <laughs> and if it did, none of us would have wives. Our girlfriends would never be impressed with us and marry us, right? So God built that in there. He knew what was going on. He says, but instead of being demanding and authoritarian, instead of making you pay my way, instead of making you call me sir and salute or stand up every time I came into the room, whatever demanding way he would want that to be done, he says, rather, we were gentle among you. Now, there are many, many, many Greek manuscripts that instead of having the word gentle, have the word babies among you, which the difference is the letter N at the beginning. Hippioi is gentle. Nippioi is babies. There's even one Greek manuscript that has hippos there, which is horses, but we were horses among you. We're pretty sure that one's not right. But the point is sort of the same. Either he's saying we, were, we either acted like babies bringing you the word of God in a way you could understand, or gentle among you, not being uh, this authoritarian, in-your-face, uh, angry demanding as, as apostles coming into there. He said, but, but rather he takes this image of a nursing mother. And the thing about the, the nursing mother, uh, actually we'll continue through verse 8. So, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. The thing that's unique about a role of a mother from a role of a father is that a mother is physically giving of her own body in bringing this child into the world and then caring for that child at a very young age, that a father uh, is not as connected. And so Paul is using this image of, of motherhood here to say that as he was involved and the people with him were involved in the forming of the church here at Thessalonica, they weren't just sharing words, but rather they were sharing of their own selves. They were sacrificing bodily to, to give them life, to give their church life, to, to bring them the message. And we, as a, as, a, as a family unit here as a church, need to understand that message, that we can't just have a statement of faith that's on the internet or when we're at the grocery store and somebody asks us, we get mad about what's going on and tell them that it's wrong, but rather we need to be ready to give of ourselves. When we hear about the crisis with abortion that's going on, we, we got to do more than just stand in front of a clinic protesting, but rather we have to be willing to financially support women who are afraid they're going to starve their children to death because of their situation, or take them into our homes when they're in a violent situation and they're afraid that their boyfriend who's gotten them pregnant is going to abuse them or even cause their child to be miscarried through domestic violence. We have to be willing to allow a, a woman who's having a child to have enough time off of work without punishing her and her career because she's missed work to care for her child, which is all of our futures. It's more than words. And Paul is making the analogy of this mother. There's a statement I read as I was reading in this that came from a guy named Newt Larson. He says, arguing whether the church should meet people's physical needs or whether it should limit itself to preaching the gospel 
is like debating which wing of an airplane is more important. Both, he says, are essential. So Paul now is speaking of his ministry as this example of a nursing mother, and he continues on in verses 9 and 10. He says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and our toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward your believers. Going back to verse 9, he says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and our toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. When somebody looked at the Apostle Paul, they couldn't just say, he has the right message. They had to say more than that. They had to say, and he works hard. He works in such a way that he is physically fatigued, that that his work is hard, and that I can see that he's doing that for our good. He says, so he wouldn't be a burden to you, to the Thessalonians. And we, as fathers, especially church members, need to understand that we can't go home and tell our kid that um, you don't know how hard I work for you, so you're just being a brat. Rather, we should be working hard in a way that they recognize the work that we do is that they would not be burdened. There's a significant amount of um, current language and communication through media that wants to say that what you do and who you are are not intimately connected. That you just made a mistake and and that's not really, you're really a good guy. But Paul has this different opinion. He says what you do, the way you behave, the, the way you work, the way you care for others is actually a reflection of the soul that is inside of you, the character that exists inside of you. If you happen to be uh, the guy who is a custodian, and you're always knocking off and not doing a good job as a custodian, it's not because you have a bad job. Because your character doesn't tell you to do a good job at your job. And Paul was, of course, a a leather worker, a tent maker. This was a very physically demanding job. It's not a real pleasant job either. The chemicals that they used to tan the leather were uh, rather pungent. Okay, you know the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 where he's sitting on the rooftop and Paul's sitting on the rooftop and he gets the, the vision you know, of these animals that came down and he's hungry and all that, right? Well, he was at a tanner's house. So he would have been, well, we're from Covington. We understand. There was a mill shut down. Just bring the plant back up. The digesters aren't quite up to temp yet, right? There's a certain je ne sais quoi in the air. That when you go outside, you're not thinking, let's barbecue. I'm so hungry. Well, in the same way, this... This was true. There was, there was a, 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 an air about Paul. I mean, an air about Paul. Because he was a leather worker. Yet, he'd, he labored at that and toiled at that and didn't have any shame in that. In fact, he proclaimed that by his working hard at that, he was doing it for the benefit of the folks here in Thessalonica, he actually accepted money from a, a, a whole nother church that he might uh, be able to work this wearying, hard job for them. I think we would have a much better viewpoint of society if we encourage people that it's okay to have a job that requires you to work hard and be wearied.
the old Mike Rowe uh, personality is, is, is proclaiming that truth to our country as well. And, and Paul was very much on board with that, but he took it even a step further. He didn't just say that, God, that the job was good. He said that if you do a good job at it, it's because of your character. And then he goes on, and and in verse 10, he has this statement. He says, you are witnesses. So again, you remember in verse 9, and then in verse 10, you are witnesses. He's saying, you already know this because you can see it with your own eyes. And God also. He was so confident now in verse 10 that he added as a witness to the truth of his statement, the testimony of God, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. And these ideas are are closely related, but there is a little bit of distinction in them. When he says how holy, he said set apart for God. Whether he was working in the tannery or whether he was preaching the gospel in the synagogue or whether he was going to the the culture on Mars Hill and proclaiming the truth of of God's word to to the thinkers and philosophers there, he said everything he did, he did it in a way where people saw him would say he is set apart for God. One of the more challenging questions that a Christian could ask themselves, and I can't remember who presented the idea at first, uh, was that if you were to be placed on trial for being a Christian, would you be found guilty? Is there sufficient testimony in your life that if somebody was going to objectively look at the evidence of your life, would the characteristics of being set apart for God as a Christian be sufficient to convict you of that. Righteousness is the idea of this comparison, of this standard. Here's a a rule or a regulation. In this case, it would be the, the law of God and the law of love, especially for Paul. He said, you could look at my life and the the life of the people that came and worked alongside of him and say, absolutely, we can say they are righteous or righteous compared to the law of God. And blameless means that in and among the people, they haven't done the people any wrong. They're without reproach. And God can see that, that they they haven't done anything wrong. So in verse 10, he says, our conduct toward your believers as a witness to God was holy, righteous, and blameless. We did it for God. We did it according to God's standards and you all have nothing that you can say against us because we are blameless in your presence. None of us as fathers are going to escape fatherhood with that testimony. But we have a, a God who forgives, and we have a God who says, I haven't taken away your duty as a father. So Paul is going to continue here in verses 11 and 12. For you know how, and now he uses the image of a father. Like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And so he he breaks down three purposes of a father here. The first purpose that he gives is the word encourage. In Greek, this is parakaleo. That should sound familiar to you because you may know the word paraclete. Paraclete is the Greek word for the Holy Spirit. See, Paul says like a father with the children, he was close beside calling into evidence the truth of that person. This is saying Yeah, you didn't run the fastest race today, son or daughter, but you ran it as hard as you could run it. You remember all the work you did training for that race that you ran? You can still do better, but you did the best you could do today. You remember how much you studied for that test, and maybe you you aced your SOL. She's not here, is she? Yes, she is. Paisley on your math SOL. Congratulations. encouraging to say, remember how hard you worked for that. And maybe you missed it by one point. Maybe you got a 399. Is that the number? And you go home heartbreaking 
broke that word, disappointed that you missed it by one point. Paul says, like a father with his children says, look, you were this close. Did you give it your all? Did you study for it? Did you pay attention in class all year? Because you know you can do better, and, and, it, and, and with having not tried your hardest, you were that close. Imagine how good you're going to be when you do give it your all. This is what the Holy Spirit does for us in our Christian life. He convicts us where we fall short. He encourages us when we're doubting. He brings the reality of the Word of God and brings it to bear in our life. And as fathers do with their children, they do the same thing with the testimony of their life. And he gives a second word that's very, very similar, paramutheomai, close behind, giving soothing words. Notice both of these have that Greek preposition para with it. This, this word para, there's, there's several words that we can translate in English as the word with, and they have different degrees of understanding. There's, there's the word para, which is where we get the word parabaleo, right? Parable, to throw alongside of. That's a, a story that matches reality, that kind of explains what's going on, right? It's a parable. The paraclete, we already mentioned, the Holy Spirit. We, we use this word in English when we talk about a sentence, and then right in the middle of the sentence, there is a parenthesis. There's a, there's a statement that isn't quite the same as the sentence, but it gives a little bit more detail, or maybe another thought that goes alongside that thought. But they're very closely connected. And we shouldn't miss the point that like a father with the children is closely connected with their child to be able to speak these truths about them in their life, to give them that encouragement and to give them that comfort, that, that walking together in closeness. It can be hard when you've only got so much time and you as a dad have your own interests and your child is doing something that maybe you're not that interested in, ballet or something. But you go to the ballet recital, you go to the practice, and you encourage and you comfort your child while they're there, not for your sake, but for theirs. You're their father. It doesn't matter if you're interested or not. You love your child. You're involved in your child. And he gives this third word, which is now a little bit different, the word urge, marturomai. You may have heard the word martyr before. Now, martyr in English means to die for your faith, but the word actually means to give a testimony. Urge is to give a testimony to your, to your children. That doesn't mean to explain to them about how God has changed your life as a, as a, as a witness to them, but rather to call them to witness on where they can do better. To say... Uh, you're almost to the top of that mountain. Don't let go of the rock. Keep climbing. You're almost done with school. Keep studying. You've almost passed your welding exam, and I understand you're frustrated because aluminum spits real bad when you get it too hot, and you're really frustrated because you can't quite get the aluminum weld down just right. But keep trying and keep practicing. You will get there urging them to do better, urging them, giving them the confidence, encouraging them, walking close beside, calling into evidence the things that are true about their life, whether they're good things or bad things that they haven't done, comforting them, giving them soothing, and urging them, getting them the, the motivation to press on to the goal. He said, these are characteristics of a father. And in the same way, he and his testimony as an apostle going to the church there in Thessalonica was the same way, but it wasn't just generic encouragement, generic comfort, and generic urging, but it was toward a specific goal. And as fathers, we need to not take our eye off the ball, if you'll carry that analogy with me. He says, to walk in a manner worthy of God. One of my favorite um, comedy movies is the young Frankenstein. Is it young Frankenstein? And the, the Igor, it's Igor, 
says, walk this way. And he, you know, that is not what Paul means by walk in a manner worthy of God. He's not talking about a particular, you know, strut. He's rather saying the way you live your life, that, that walk is a, is a common analogy for the way you live your life. He says, as fathers did to their children, they, they encouraged, comforted, and urged them, but not just in generic, but to order that they would walk in their own lives in a manner worthy of God. This is the idea of discipling our children. This is what Deuteronomy 6, right? The Shema, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Elohim, Yahweh Ehud, Hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. Teach your children in everything that you do. Walking, coming, going, eating, sitting down, tying, bind them as a, as a um, frontlet on your, on your forehead even. Always have them before your eyes. Teach your children. And I wonder how many fathers are disappointed if their children leave the faith as adults, if the investment in encouraging, comforting, and urging that was given their all, that, that they poured into their children as best they could as the way that, what does Paul say? God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. I know there are plenty of kids that, that leave the faith once mom and dad don't make them go to church anymore as adults. And God says, I will bring the increase. You do what you have been called to do and you've been called to do this chore, this task, this privilege, really, as a father to encourage, comfort, and urge them to walk in their life in a manner worthy of the Lord. It was interesting to me as I was preparing for the sermon, I was reading through uh, a lot of uh, social um, literature from like the National Institute of Health and parenting organizations and one of the interesting uh, characteristics from about 2000 through today was that the, the research kept pointing to what they called a significant change in the view of, society, of American society on the role of a father as having changed from the breadwinner and disciplinarian to being more involved at every stage of a child's life, changing diapers, feeding babies, taking your kid to the, you know, park or whatever and playing with them, helping them with their homework. He said for decades and decades that was always viewed as the role of a mother and they said that this has been changing and what they've been surprised by is that the children who grow up in homes with parents who are involved in every phase of their child's life, they tend to end up um, better socially adjusted, have a higher education, uh, have better financial success. They tend to not be divorced as they grow up. They tend to not have children out of wedlock. They tend to not end up in prison. They tend to, you know, everything that we would look at as good and positive is a trend, regardless of the neighborhood the kid lives in, regardless of the status of the wealth of the parent, regardless of the, the gender of the child, regardless of the race of the child, regardless of, uh, you know, like all these other, fa the education of the parents. There's actually a study done that talked about parents who are involved in kids' homework, and one of the most significant excuses is, I don't understand that. And the research said the parent doesn't have to understand it. They just have to be interested in what the kid is doing, and the kid will do better at it. They were surprised that when parents, especially fathers, acted as God thought fathers should act, the kids did better. Amazing. It seems like we keep rediscovering the truth of God in, in the, the social world today. One of the things Paul did not say that he did, he provided for himself and the people that were with him, but, but he did not identify one of his top three priorities here of what a father did was providing for that church working overtime, getting that second job, making sure their kid had 
you know, the, the Nikes instead of the, the niches or whatever the off-brand shoe was, right? That wasn't in his list of priorities. And, and, and what was true for God is true for all. There was a study in 2005 at the University of Florida. That was the handout that you have right here. Being an involved father, what does it mean? And I just want to go through this paragraph on page two. Don't confuse providing with loving. Men men may get caught up with the idea that providing for children is the best way to care for and express love for them. While it's true that creating the means for food, clothes, and shelter is a great way to provide for a child, it is not the only way to show caring. In fact, these basics are just the beginning. There is a maxim. I've never seen a tombstone that read, I'd wished I'd spent more time at work. The message is that as we grow older, most of us wish we would have spent more time with our families and less time trying to get ahead at work. In the same way, you probably have never heard a child say, I wish my dad spent more time at work. More than anything in the world, children want their parents' attention and love. Further research shows that children who receive positive attention from their parents, we'll call that encouraging, comforting, and urging, do better in most all aspects of their lives, home, school, work, etc., than children who do not receive this attention. This is regardless of how much money they have, the type of neighborhood they live in. So remember, being a good father doesn't mean making sure your child has all the best toys or lives in the best neighborhood. It means making sure your child has all the benefits of having you in their life. The social studies and research found this to be true for kids who were already involved in social services because they were... um, you know, in trouble for some reason. They found, uh, they found this to be true of, of kids who didn't have their dads there, either because their dads were in jail or they were homeless or had died, that when another man, whether that be in the church or in the community, steps in and, and takes that place and takes that role and accepts that responsibility to be involved in the life of the child, all of these truths come to be. And notice Paul compared differently the role of the mother and the role of the father here. The purpose of the father taking on that interest and being involved is is true regardless of the age of the child. They say the most important relationship that a girl between the ages of 18 and 26 has is with her father. Many of us think the kid's out of the house now. I can just move on. And not all of us have had the privilege of necessarily having a father who is there with us. And we all know somebody who's like that, and many of us can can be that person that can come alongside and be that surrogate, be that, that person who instills in that child the fact that you do love and care about what happens in their life that you want to see them be successful, that you're going to hold them accountable to walk in a manner worthy of God, that you're going to be there to encourage them, to comfort them, to urge them on. And because they aren't your flesh and blood doesn't mean that you can't share that same love for them. We have a a great example of our own Father in heaven who gave us his son that we could be co-heirs adopted into his family, that we would move from sinner to saint by putting our faith in Jesus. It's a, a definite challenging thing to have this role and to understand the responsibility, and none of us walks this path alone. Whether you have your own kids or whether you're invested in the, the kids of, that, that are in your neighborhood or in your church, All of us have a comforter that's with us, who urges us, who exhorts us to walk in a manner worthy of God if we're Christians. This is the challenge today. What is the purpose of a father? It's not just to provide for needs, although that is a basic truth. It's not just paying alimony and child support, but rather it is to set the example in our own lives 
of what it means to walk in a manner worthy of God, and it is to nurture or disciple in godliness the, the, the people that we have been given by God who have been called into his own kingdom and glory for his glory. As the praise team comes up now to close out this service, I think it's time. I'm not sure that that's not set up as the uh, stage monitor, so I don't have a clock and I can't see the... I, I'm wearing a watch. Yeah, it's time. As, as we're closing out and we're thinking about, you know, the many ways that God has opportunity to either be a mother or be a father to someone in our life, uh, we shouldn't fail to recognize that, that God himself didn't create these roles out of nothing, but that he created them out of his own character. It is because of who God is that being a good father is good for kids. It is because of who God is that being a good mother is what makes for good mothers. And, and it's because God has given us this role to reflect that kingdom responsibility and the glory of God that we can be successful at it. That it isn't something that we need to necessarily struggle and try harder and hope we do a better job at, but rather something that we can lean into the power of God and work God into the community of God to help us, to, to grow us, to hold us accountable, to give us the encouragement, to, to give us the hope that we are uh, going to be successful if we, if we obey God. I want to reiterate the truth that all of this is dependent on is that being in Christ is, is where that empowerment comes from. You may not be a parent. You may be a young man or a young woman who is listening today that may think, I'm never going to be a parent. I'm never going to have that responsibility. Maybe you're older and you, you never did have kids of your own. But I, I guarantee you, the kids that looked up to you, whether you be a, a teacher or a preacher or the person who takes the garbage out, people see what you do and they look up to how you're doing your job if you're setting that example. And walking in a manner worthy of God begins with being in Christ. And there is no successful way to walk in a manner worthy of Christ without being in Christ. We can, we can stumble. We can fail. We can get back on the horse and turn our mind and our eyes back to Christ and try to pursue him again, and he's ready and willing to take us back. But if we haven't taken that first step of being in Christ. Well, you will not have that testimony for your children. That doesn't mean they won't come to faith, but it won't be your testimony as a father. It won't be your testimony as a mother that will have led them there. the act of living our lives in a manner worthy of the calling of the kingdom of God and his glory is a, a very heavy responsibility if you were to try to take it up in your own strength. And it can seem like there's no way that this can be done. There's no way that I can be successful at that. Many parents, when they become first-time parents, are quite terrified of what that means for them and their life and what it's going to be like. And will I be able to keep this child alive even the first night I have at home without help? We have the, the ultimate helper in Christ if we put our faith in him. We have the ultimate hope in him if we are willing to trust him and believe his word. If you have 
kids here today that, that are, are not uh, walking in a, in a manner worthy of the kingdom of God and you didn't invest in them as best you could and walk, it's never too late. You know, God was involved at every step of every person's life in his ministry for three straight years and Judas kissed him on the cheek. I understand the, the pain of people who have loved ones that they know that haven't come to Christ or, or flat out reject the testimony of Scripture that live uh, in sin perpetually. God calls us not to be their judge. God doesn't call us to be uh, demanding on them but to encourage, to comfort, to urge to the truth, to share the testimony of the truth of God's word, to walk in a manner ourselves that is worthy, that is testifiable of holiness and righteousness and blamelessness. So let us begin. If you don't know Christ, today is your day. If you are a Christian and you believe in Christ and you know things you have not done or could have done more, You can right now and return right back to it and begin again brand new. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, the truth of raising people's lives, being involved and invested, as Paul an apostle was to the Thessalonians and compared his ministry to that of a mother and father, for those of us who are parents, I pray the truth of this responsibility would not be overwhelming, but encouraging. That we wouldn't despair of where we have fallen short, but that we would be comforted by the truth that your word has promised that the purpose of our life was ordained by you for your glory. And that we would be urged to, to walk in a manner worthy of your kingdom and your glory ourselves, that we would be seen as holy, righteous, and, and blameless, that we would invest with more than words but with our very lives into those whom you've given us uh, charge over, and that we would not be demanding but discipling and loving according to your purpose. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us. We're going to close the service with Whom Shall I Fear?
Have a good rest of your Sunday.